Um, I shared with last service, and I'll share with you all. Um, my wife and I, we moved down here 12 years ago. Um, and you heard Pastor mention in the video about me teaching at the Masters Academy, okay? We moved down here for that purpose. All we have known prior to Florida was Ohio, okay? Well, I've ministered the word for a while, and in Ohio, it was customary <laughs> when the man or the woman of God would speak for their spouse to stand and say a few words. Um, I will not do that to my wife. Um, because I know she hates that, but I do want to honor her um, because understand me when I tell you, she is my girl, without a doubt. Um, those that have been married any amount of time, it, I thank God not just for a godly woman, but a woman that is strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, so I honor her and I value her. Um, but without further ado, let me come down to the people I want to do three things today. I want to inspire you, encourage you, and challenge. I want to inspire you to dream big, to take the limits off of God, okay? I want to encourage you to never settle for less than God's best for your life, okay? But I also want to challenge you to think differently. I want you to think on another level. I want to challenge you with that, okay? But I do want you to do me a favor. I'm a teacher at the heart, and I know my students love, I teach juniors and seniors, and they love their phones, okay? So those of you that have your phone, go on and take it out for me just now, okay? Go ahead and take it out. It's okay. We won't write you up. <laughs> And, and, and what I want you to do is, is uh, I'm going to take one with you, okay? Take out your phones and go to your little camera and take a selfie of yourself, okay? <laughs> yeah, go and do that. Take a, I'm going to take another one. I took one first, service. We're going to take one now, okay? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to dive into the middle of chapter 13 of Numbers. Chapter 13, verses 26 through 33, okay? They'll have it on the screen for you. I'm starting in the middle, but I'm not going to leave you there. This will set the stage for where we are going today, okay? I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it reads as follows at verse 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land, okay? They brought back evidence of the fruit of the land. They brought back what they had found. And verse 27, then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people. He quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Verse 32, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. Verse 33, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Agnac came from the giants, watch this now, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. 
We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. We were like grasshoppers, not in their sight, but in our own sight. Watch this. And so were we in their sight. We saw ourselves as grasshoppers. If I had to give you a title today, I would simply title this message, Grasshopper. Just one word, Grasshopper. If my good friends in the back room will put up the first image for me, I want to tell you a story that was shared with me many years ago, okay? And this will set the stage for where we're going today. Many years ago, I was told the story of a young man by the name of Mr. Brown who worked here in the United States, and he worked here in the United States, but he represented a family who was a royal family who lived overseas. And he oversaw their businesses here in the United States. And once a year, he would travel over to the foreign land in which they lived, the other country, and he would spend maybe two, two and a half weeks there, do some business, connect with them. And every time he would go there, upon his departure back to the United States, they would want to bless him with a gift. Now you have got to understand, this man does not lack resources, okay? But he understood that going there, it was the culture there that if someone offered you a gift, to not take it would offend them. So in years past, he would ask for some cufflinks, a necktie, okay? Obviously, he could buy these things for himself, but he said, okay, you want to bless me, fine. Well, he's leaving the family, the royal family, and as upon his departure back to the United States, they said, you know what's customary, Mr. Brown, we want to thank you for all that you do for us. We'd like to bless you with a gift. He tells them, I would like a golf club. They said, a golf club? He said, yeah, a golf club. Now, you see the picture there, that's a picture of some golf clubs. He just wanted one, just one club, golf club. They said, okay. He boards the plane, flies back to the United States. Three weeks pass, four weeks pass, it's the weekend. He's at home with his wife. Saturday, he has on his pajama bottoms, T-shirt. He hears a knock at the door. He runs down the steps, open the door, and standing in the doorway is a representative from the royal family. And they say to Mr. Brown, um, are you Mr. Brown? Mr. Brown says, yes, I'm Mr. Brown, what can I do for you? He says, I'm a member of the royal family. I'm here to take you to your golf club. <laughs> He says, golf club? He was like, yeah, your gift. He was like, okay, honey, I'll be right back. He puts on his house shoes, runs outside. The member of the royal family, the representative, he goes to the driver's side and he's looking at Mr. Brown because Mr. Brown is looking into the back seat of the vehicle thinking that the golf club was in the back seat. He didn't see it, so he said, oh, it must be in the trunk. He goes to the trunk and he looks at the member of the royal family who then says to him, it's not in the trunk, I'm going to take you to it. Mr. Brown thinks that, oh, okay, we're going to Dick's Sporting Goods or Sport Authority. So he says to his wife, honey, I'll be back in about a half hour, 45 minutes. He gets in the car and they begin to drive. Drive past Dick's, drive past Sports Authority. They get on the expressway. And Mr. Brown's a little nervous. Because they've been driving for some time. Now they get off the expressway they take a side road, now they're driving on a lone country road, out in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden, image number two, they drive up to this. They drive up, and Mr. Brown gets out of the vehicle and looks around. Keep in mind now, he has on a t-shirt, pajama bottoms, and house shoes. He's standing there, and the man gets out in his royal apparel, and he looks at him and says, um, Sir, what is this? The representative of the royal family said, This is your golf club. He says, 
All the employees' salaries have been paid. We take care of all of that. 18 holes, putting greens, everything here is yours. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to pay for it, you don't have to rent it. All you have to do is receive it. But it was quiet in here. I didn't hit something. Isn't it funny how you can have two people, they look at a word, golf club, but they look at it from two different perspectives. Mr. Brown was thinking golf club. Royal family thinking golf club. I want to put today's text in context for you, and as I do that, I want to extrapolate, if you will, some nuggets that we can apply to us in present day. I also want to encourage you that as you read the Word of God, especially when you read the Old Testament, I want to encourage you to look at the Old Testament through a New Covenant, New Testament set of lenses, okay? Because we are not looking forward to the cross, we're coming from the cross. We're not looking forward to victory, we are victory. We are victorious, okay? It's, it's very important that you understand that as we dive into this. Let me give you some background and bring you current, okay? The children of Israel have been in bondage for 430 years. Moses is raised up by daddy and he sends him in there to free the children of Israel. They cross the Red Sea, the Egyptians drown in the Red Sea, and now they are in the wilderness. But daddy never pulled them out of Egypt and, br and brought them into wilderness to stay. Okay? He was getting them ready for the promised land, the land of Canaan. Okay? So now, the Lord told Moses, Moses, select some men to go out and spy out the land. Go in and check it out. I want to know, I want them to find out that people are strong if they're weak. I want them to find out about the vegetation and all these things. And I want them to get all their, collect all their data, do a lot of research which I thought was very interesting as God was taking me through this because any time daddy is leading you into something, he wants you to get involved in the research process. He wants you to do your research because I have learned this down through the years. You cannot make quality decisions based upon poor information. Let me tell you why. Because ignorance is expensive. Anywhere you apply that in your life, you will be blessed. I told them first service, and I share this with you all. Many of my students, they're teenagers, juniors and seniors, 16 years old to 18 years of age, they're all about relationships, platonic and romantic. I get that. We were created by a relational God to be in relationships, absolutely. And you know the fellas, Coach, she look good. I understand that. The young ladies, ooh, Coach, he's attractive. I get all of that. I get all of that. I said, but troops, there's got to be more than just how they look. Because fineness will wear off. <laughs> fineness, oh she fine, absolutely, today. <laughs> but it will wear off. Now understand, hear my heart, I'm not saying she loses her attractiveness as she ages. But what I'm saying is, when life comes at you, those of you that are married know exactly what I'm talking about. When life comes at you fast and hard, you need somebody that's a pit bull that's gonna fight and stand in faith. You ain't got time for nobody that's soft, weak, mealy mouth. The devil is a lie. See, oh my gosh, you know, Listen, when I was born and raised, I was taught that praying in tongues and being baptized in the Spirit, all that stuff had passed. But then I had children. I got filled with the Holy Ghost real quick. Because you need Spirit of the living God. To, I know I do, but them jokers, I got. I need God. I'm trying to get us to understand that God wants us getting involved in the process, but we got to do our research. So he sends in 12 spies to check out the land. And those 12 spies were there for 40 days, okay? Two of those 
12 spies with Joshua and Caleb. We pick up in the text where they now have returned to the people and they are giving them a report of what they saw. They even brought back evidence of fruit from the land. If you study this out, the Bible says, if you read it for yourself, it's in the Bible, you can read it for yourself. They brought back some fruit. They brought back a cluster of grapes and they were so big, it took two men to carry them on a beam, one on the front end, one on the back end, and they had to squat and carry them. I think this through, I just want to bless you with this. If the grapes were that big that it took two grown men to carry a big cluster of grapes back to them, keep in mind, this is the size of the grapes after Adam and Eve had got put out the garden. If they were that big after, how big were they before? Now you look at a cluster of grapes, they this big. You could throw the whole thing in your mouth, see? They brought back evidence. They brought back evidence and they told the people, yes, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Not literally, meaning that it's opulent, it's full of abundance. Yes, 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 yes. All these things that God said is true. However, the people there are stronger than we are. They're stronger than us. And the cities are big, the walls are tall. And here it is now. They go there and they bring back an evil report. Now, let me put a pause button here. Because oftentimes when I heard this preached when I was growing up, whoever was speaking on this would always throw the 10 spies under the bus. But I want us to look at it from their perspective. Because I want you to understand these individuals, although they are the chosen children of God, have been in bondage for over 400 years in Egypt. So you got to know being in that environment that long they probably started to think like the Egyptians, believe like the Egyptians, live like the Egyptians who worship idol gods. Everything they did appealed to the senses. Here it is, now they're out in the wilderness, okay, and they now are being encouraged to put their faith and trust in the God that they do not know. See, oftentimes, when you read the Word of God, all throughout the Scripture, God is saying, trust me, I love you, fear not, take courage, trust, take courage, fear not, trust me, take courage, fear not. Think this through, saints of God. If we already trusted Him, there would be no need to say it. The reason He has to tell us that, here it is, because when you first get born again, you don't know God to trust him. You got to learn him, see. It's a process, see there. Which brings me to the reason why he brought them to the wilderness. He didn't bring them to the wilderness to stay. He was getting them ready for where they were going. Had he took them straight out of Egypt, right into the promised land, what was meant to bless them would have ruined them because they didn't have the mentality to handle it. They would, listen, you got to understand this. They saw themselves as slaves. Pause. I don't know if this show still comes on TV, but years ago there used to be a show called The Biggest Loser. Some of y'all may be familiar with that, okay? When the contestants that were selected to go into the show, when they were reached out to them and they said, you made the show, they would fly them out to this ranch in California, okay? If I'm in New Jersey, I make the show, they would fly me out from New Jersey over here to California. They would take me out of the environment that had a hand in me gaining the weight. That's the first part of the process. But once I get on that ranch, they start talking to me about my diet, about eating, what not, what have you, but then they would go deeper. And start talking about things that I experienced back in my childhood, some old hurts that I've been hanging on to. Why is that so important? And how does that apply to the scripture? It's one thing to pull you out of the environment. It's altogether something different to get the environment out of you. See, once daddy pulled them out of Egypt, yes, I pulled you out of Egypt, now I gotta get Egypt out of you. See, 
Because if you go in there with that jacked up way of thinking, what was meant to bless you will hurt you. I told them last service, and I'm going to tell you all, if Pastor Norm wanted to ruin a young lady or a young man fresh out of Bible college, you know what he would do? He would give them the keys to everything right now. He would give them the keys to everything, both campuses, run it, and it would ruin them because they don't have the intestinal fortitude, they don't have the character or the integrity to handle it. Because when God, listen, when he leads you into what he has for you, there will be shade thrown. Hear me. People will hate you for no other reason than because you blessed. And you got to have skin that can take that. You got to be tough enough to handle all that comes along with what God has for you. See, we live in a day and time where people want the promise without the process. Oh my gosh, I'm going to preach this. We want the promises of God, but we don't want to go through nothing. But wait a minute. In case I got a bad copy, it's first the cross, then the crown. See, we get excited about resurrection, but listen to me. That means nothing if he don't go on the cross. You got to be willing to go through some stuff. I am, t- listen to me. I tell my students this, these past couple years, and I've been jumping on this for a while. Every last single caterpillar wants to be a butterfly. They do. They want to be a butterfly. But that's not the question. The question is, are you willing to get your tail into that cocoon and go through the process of becoming one? Because this is what I know. There are some things that only the cocoon can teach you. You can't learn it in no classroom. I don't care how many books you buy, you, ain't gonna be, you gotta go through it. See there? People like the idea of an awesome marriage. We had, that, we had that smart conference up here, and we had different groups of people up here, different ages and stages of life and whatnot, what have you. People sat back like, oh, I want a marriage like this, that, and the other. Be careful. Because you see them on stage. That didn't happen overnight. I'm going to shut up. That's too heavy. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone. No, no. But see, the process, saints of God, ain't to hurt us. It's to get us ready. You got, listen, what glory would it have brought God to leave them in the wilderness? That don't make no sense. No, I brought you out to take you in, but I got to get you ready, see. But you heard what I read. They were full of fear, doubt and unbelief. And all of a sudden, Caleb steps to the forefront and says, he quieted the people. What does that word mean, he quieted them? He had to settle them down because it was all over the place, because he could tell by their faces that based upon what the leaders were saying, it started to get full of fear. Caleb steps to the stage and says, wait a minute. Matter of fact, he said this. Caleb quieted the people and said, let us go up at once and take possession, because we are well able to overcome them. Let us go up at once, not tomorrow, not next year, today. Now watch this. Not one time in the text did he say what they saw was wrong. He didn't say, no, they lying. No, everything they saw, I saw the same thing, but my focus is not on what I saw. My focus is on what God said, and he said, that land is ours. The 10 spies placed a higher premium on what they saw. Joshua and Caleb placed a higher premium on what God said. But now watch this. I can't throw shade on the 10 spies because If our perspective of God is wrong, we will do the same thing. Nowhere in Scripture did God call the children of Israel grasshoppers. They called themselves that. God said, you are my chosen people. This is how I see you. But this is how they saw themselves. God was thinking golf club. They thinking golf club. You know what's interesting? I'm not putting people down. I know. I was born and raised that once you get born again, you know, you're still a sinner saved by grace. Well, now, wait a minute. If y'all could put this verse up for me. 
um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, now I didn't write this, Paul wrote this. He said, when, when someone becomes a Christian, we got any Christians in here? Anybody a Christian? Okay, well, if anybody's a Christian, he's a brand new person. Where? On the inside. You're not a combination of the old and the new. You're brand new. He is not the same anymore. He is not the same anymore in the Greek and Hebrew means exactly what you just read. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. But we have a lot of Christians that still want to hang on to the old. And I want to ask you something. If God is not hanging on to it, why are we? See, according to the word of God, oh my gosh, the clock is not on my side. Listen at this. <laughs> according to the word of God, you and Al, you forgiven, you healed, you the righteousness of God. Wait a minute. That next verse, put that next verse up for me, my brother. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is a representative. In order for you to represent your king well, you got to know him. See, we're representatives. Hear me now. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Listen to me. Last year, my wife and I and the kids, we went to Kentucky and visited the Creation Museum. If you get a chance, I would really encourage you to do that. The Creation Museum and the Ark Experience. At the Creation Museum, as we're walking through there, we come to the end of the exhibit, and they are... I mean, they are intentional about communicating to everybody that comes through there that everything that Adam lost, everything that Adam lost, they are intentional about communicating that Jesus got back. The Bible says that if you've been born again, that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Sin, one of, one of the meanings of sin is separation, okay? If you've been born again and Christ is in you, how can you still be separated from him? I am telling you, when you don't know these things, you still see yourself as a worm in the dust trying to make heaven your home. Let me help you. You ain't got to try to make heaven your home because it's already yours right now. See, because of Jesus. So when you get Jesus, you get it all. Everything that Adam lost, Jesus got back. See there? The Bible says that because of Jesus, we are generous, compassionate. We're kings and priests. The, according to the word of God, you royalty. Not in the great by and by, right now. Now see, I'm saying this to some of y'all like, well, you don't know what I've done last week. Listen to me. We're talking about renewing your mind to who God says you are right now. You know why I'm talking to you like this? Because you got territory to go take. God got purpose for every last single one of us. Gifts, talents, and abilities have been put in you before the foundation of the world. And I am telling you, you are doing nobody any favors dumbing yourself down. You're not doing us any favor. I'm not going to pursue the dream. Why not? I tell my players that I coach, somebody got to win tonight. It might as well be us. Somebody got to get it. Might as well be us. I'm telling us the exact same thing. All that God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ, do you honestly think he did that for us to settle for less than his best? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Somebody has got to impact your sphere of influence. Might as well be you. Might as well be you. See, God has wired and created us in such a way that the environment that he places us in needs the gifts and abilities that are within us. And as you step into that environment and that environment pulls on that gift, the people are blessed and you are fulfilled and God gets the glory. You are effective, you are productive, and you are impactful. A life well lived. But see, that does not happen as long as we see ourselves as worms, in the dust. I'm just a wretch. No, you in the family of God. Jesus said, as I am, so are you in this world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. See that? Come on, that's in the Bible. Okay? Now, let me bless you. I know some of us are encouraged and you want to go out and take on the world. I get it. I get it. But let me bless you. I was 23 years old, okay? I'm out of college. 
I need to tell you this so it'll make sense. I played high school basketball, I played college basketball. My, I majored in sociology and social work. I knew that I wanted to work with young people. I knew I wanted to be around the game of basketball in some way, but I didn't know how that was going to come together. I just didn't know. Coaching had never dawned on me. I'm sitting in my pastor study at the time, okay? Now, he has since changed and whatnot, but where he was at that time, I'm 23. Although I was a Christian, I didn't know God. You know there's a difference, okay? Knew a lot about the Word, but didn't know Him. Okay, so I'm sitting there, and I'm spiritually immature, and i tell you why I say that. Because my pastor looks at me and says to me, Tony, I know you love working with young people, and I know you enjoy basketball, but God can't use that. Now, I left the study that day, and I remember I had like this, 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 this churning with a negative feeling on the inside, like, what in the world? And I wish I could tell you it was that same day. It wasn't that day. It wasn't a month later. But sometime later, I'm reading the Word. I'm growing because I'm like, there's got to be more to life than this right here. And Daddy says to me, Tony, yes, that was my child talking to you that day. But that was not me. What I put in you, I put in you for a reason. Why would you step away from that? Now, I'll be 45 years of age this year. If you, if you subtract 45, I'm sorry, 23 from 45, that's 22. I've been working with teenagers and coaching basketball for 22 years. So now, if I'm idealistic and I'm a dreamer, then let me stay asleep, because I've been asleep for 22 years. I am telling you, doing it God's way is the best way, and you will never regret doing it. But, but let me be honest with you, there will be shade thrown. Cats will come at you and say some of the dumbest stuff, and they mean well. You're going to always have somebody trying to tell you what can't be done, what you can't do, what you can't have. Pay attention to none of it. Because I remember when, past, when we first moved down here and we linked up with ECBC, we were over there on 436. And I remember when the Lord gave Pastor, like, you know what, we're getting ready to make a shift. And there were people that kicked up against it. But I'm telling you right now, they can say whatever they want, they can't stop you. You and God equal the majority. That's got to be your mindset. And you got to embrace the dream, you got to live it out, because the dream ain't about you, it's about the people that's going to be blessed all along the way. Those of you that know the story of Joshua and Caleb, and the children of Israel. Joshua and Caleb later on went into the promised land. Those other 10 spies did not because of doubt and unbelief. And the very thing they asked for is what they got. They died right there in the wilderness, okay? I asked you earlier in the service to take a selfie of yourself. If you wouldn't mind, pull your phones back out for me. I'm gonna pull mine out. We talked about, in today's service, about how God sees you. You righteous, you redeemed, you whole, you complete. God ain't holding your past over you. You righteous right now. You a king right now, you a queen right now. You prosper right now. But my question to you isn't how God sees you. The question I want to leave you with is how do you see yourself? Thank you.